Hello. All right, well, uh, real quick. So when I was back at the Lightbox convention uh, in September, I had the pleasure of meeting the artist Pete Morbacher, who is the artist behind the ongoing project uh, Angelarium, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, he also hosts a weekly podcast with Sam Flegel, who is also a fantasy artist, where they mentor other artists or upcoming artists with their art and the business side of things. So uh, Pete offered to bring me on board, uh, but not as a mentor, but as a mentee, uh, pretty much to help me out with uh, my art and figuring out a direction moving forward with everything. So, so far we're, we're six or seven weeks in and all the podcasts that we did were live with uh, chat and everything. And they were also recorded so you can watch them and other mentorships on their channel, which is one fantastic week. You can find the link in the description. Anyway, this video here is a collection of useful clips from the first three weeks put into one video. Anyway, uh, check it out and uh, stay tuned for some cool stuff soon. Let me just give you real quick my point of view, seeing your work. Okay, uh, yeah, let's see. It. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I really love both your work. And uh, Sam, you, I got to check out your work and that was really fun to see. And it looks like you, you enjoy what you do, which is amazing to me and I would love to get there. And it's and it's like your soul is onto the canvas, which is lovely. And then Pete, I saw your work a long time ago. It was like, uh, when I first, the first piece I saw, I think it's like the, the dude with the hands going through his, uh, mm -hmm. incredible project extreme jealousy that's what i thought I like <laughs> like it was like this guy gets it and he's there's nothing holding him back and to the point where i couldn't look at it anymore it's like okay that, every time i, I saw that it piece was the yeah. was the moment where i broke away from that was the first piece i did after i ended my co commercial career okay and that yeah. was me breaking away from it that, that was that's like amazing the feeling that is in that piece is the feeling <sighs> of me breaking away from from that older stuff. So I people always ask me what my favorite piece is, and I say it's that one because to me that piece represents that feeling you're describing, and which I think what illustrates the like? sort of magic of art, <laughs> which is that you can put an emotion into a painting and then somebody else gets that feeling out of the painting. I'm getting goosebumps. Hold up. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Seriously, like that's that shit happens all the time getting to make personal work, and it's like my favorite thing is that trend yeah. that subconscious transmission that happens so so to yeah so to continue it was like i it wasn't it's it's like your work and then other people's work who were like let's say right click savable you know there's a type of art they're like i gotta have this and then you know they buy it and, and all that stuff so it would intimidate me and remind me of my own let's say perceived inadequacy and so the comparison game goes up and then to the point that was so uncomfortable, I just scroll past those. It's like, oh yeah, that's cool. All right, I'm not gonna look at it though. <laughs> and so going to Lightbox was me challenging that. It's like, no, you're gonna go and then you're gonna expose your your existence to all these amazing artists so that you, you kind of confront your own inadequacies willingly to, to kind of overcome them. And so like, I, I, I wanted to be humbled because uh, in my head to cope with it, it's like, no, 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 no. I'm the best. I'm the best in the world. No one's better than me. I know everything. I can learn everything. And it was like the ego. And so I guess this year has been me trying to kill that part of myself. So you talked about mental health issues earlier, yeah. working on that. That's something that is very important to me. Um, mm. And something I spent a lot of time with. And it's strange because uh, I went through some really harsh things a couple of years ago. And since I've made paintings about my own experiences with things like uh depression personal worth inner okay. rage yeah, uh, yeah. a piece about like losing control inner lust those sorts of things and i've i've put those on canvas and every time they've become some of my most popular pieces even if people don't know exactly what it was about they see it and um, so that would be the thing that I'd, I'd say, you know, you're, you're worried about the fear and the fear is very much there, but man, the, the other side of it is that you will relate to people in a way yeah. where you allow them to feel heard. You allow them to feel seen, you yeah. let them feel human. And, and I often go back again to Amanda Palmer's thing of, you know, as artists, we are saying, I love you and releasing that out into the world. Oh, and, that's cool. And when someone else sees that and hears that, 
they feel like a human, they feel like a person. But for me, that took working on my own mental health things through, um, you know, therapy and, and uh, personal work and uh, spirituality and all, all of that stuff combined. I always knew what I, I could always use it as a little bit of a, a guiding compass because um, it would always tell me to run the other direction from the thing I should be running towards. And so it's a compass. Okay. Yes. And so you, you start talking about what you're scared of and you knowing that you want to head in that direction. I mean, I, that seems to me to be you being fairly aware of what is happening in your own head mm. because uh, one of the tools that I'm, uh, we're constantly trying to use to help people figure out what's important to them, mm. it should be moving towards. Because typically they say, oh, I have all these options. I don't know what to do. That's and me. So yeah. tell them, <laughs> you, what you need to do is you need to figure out what scares you. Like, where is that fear oh. start talking to you? Wait, and that's the thing. thing that you feel is most important. Because simply asking someone what they think is most important is irrelevant. Like, if the narratives in, in anyone's own head is going to be muddled. I've seen in in the concept uh, throughout the concept art world, there's this perception of art mountain. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I, think I fucking hate art mountain. I think art mountain is total bullshit. I think art mountain is what causes people to have mental. I think it gives people mental health issues. Yeah, and I think that the uh, that sort of linear the the idea of art as a linear progression of like climbing higher up the mountain is part of the reason that people end up so stuck so often is because yeah. it leads them away from their, their actual journey, which is right. probably not an art mountain, but probably just somewhere else, a swamp. <laughs> swamp or field or desert or wherever that they, it's like, there's this huge landscape of art. Um, yeah. All these places you could venture to, all these challenges you could take on, all these different people you could meet. And, but everyone keeps like throwing away all their possessions to go like, crawl their way up to the top of art mountain concept right. art mountain, for no reason whatsoever right. I, it drives me I was, crazy. that was me uh, a long time ago like yeah art mountain like it makes sense because okay so how does art mountain exist well it's because someone climbed in their own world on their own journey and they appear and they feel like they're really high, high up there superior for me it was like craig mullins and uh ian mckaig and all these like amazing artists and it's like, okay, well, I can sense that they, they've got this high technical skill and ability to make art, and I'm gonna elevate that on this thing, and I'm gonna climb this, and it feels like, okay, well, I'm supposed to go on the same path as them, and that's the big mistake. We should talk the idea of better versus worse art all the time, mm -hmm. because um, it's that perception of better versus worse art that I think poisons people against themselves yeah. and against the happiness of their of their peers and of so many it is so many toxic behaviors that come out of this concept of like better and worse art and this linear higher yeah. lower idea leveling up every time anyone says level up i just like want to gag because it's <laughs> like you know, like what is that like it, it's this idea of like you are down here i am up here but then there's these people above us and we both look like fools to them and it's just right like, who fucking cares like it, right. none of that conforms to reality it's so, like abandoning it has like has been such a wonderful thing, I think. That Pete's kind of first transition into this was actually a, a painting of Robbie, right? And I mm. think that's where you need to go, Med, is the, the first archetype you have to address is Robbie. Uh, okay. The gatekeeper. Yeah. yeah. If you need the gatekeeper. I want to paint the gatekeeper. Yeah. You the painter, you just, if you can do a, a nice finished painting... Of the of that gatekeeper figure, um, you know, work up the design. Just make sure that it, it like all oh, the symbols that are in it represent the experiences that you've had authentically. Put it in an environment that you know matches the the mood that you experience it in, and um, and then just try to do all the things that you know how to do to like finish an image to make sure it gets to a point of finish so that it looks good in print, as though it's just like a big cool ass poster. I'll give it a shot. Sure. Whatever comes, if you can do that, the results of that are going to be valuable in dollar in 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 real U.S. dollars. The other thing, uh, which is going to be really extra special, because then you're going to like be able to like eat from it. It's right, it's, right. it's cool, like <laughs> to use that stuff to pay rent and right get compliments and meet girls. <laughs> right, right. <laughs>
you know, uh, when you work for a company, you're who are you who are you doing service for? And the question and the answer is always like when you're doing commercial work, it's like you're serving, you know, arena net because you're making them DLC costumes. Right. And right. so that relationship is really clear when you're working for yourself. You're like, am I just jerking off on the Internet? Right. You know, who is this serving? The answer is clear. You are serving those people who love you and love your work. When you're making right. personal work, it is not a matter of self-service. The, ser the, the, the servitude is still there. You are, you are simply serving the people who consume the work. And they, it is a healthy and loving relationship um, that you are contributing to by continuing to make that work, which I think is never uh, talked about in, mm. in the professional context. Well, because I, I don't even think it really even comes to mind for most people that making art and putting on the internet for free is a loving act that that improves the world that is, is something that um, people want. And they, um, they celebrate not because of it of its quality but because of it you know it, it, the ways in which it enriches yeah. them cool. all right uh, learn learn yeah. something new here with our our powered by Streamyard duck <laughs> <laughs> over there anyway um okay cool so these are the types of charts charts i make i use a lot of stock imagery and whatever uh and so for me you zoom it yeah okay sweet yeah yeah i was gonna yeah uh so basically i broke it down to these six archetypes that are let's say haunting me if i'm trying to make art and uh and each one of them represents a specific thing so this guy uh on the left is this kind of mask uh, that that people would wear when they're uh inquisitive and dismissive and invalidating so it's like this kind of like what is this for what what why do you do that this is pathetic but basically this kind of rude uh tyrant right um and then the, the second one is this uh, mask of uh primal rage and wrath and ba basically when somebody's very uh overtaken by anger and frustration and they unleash that on you that's like i would, I would feel that when i was you know growing up um and it becomes one of the things that haunts you and scares you the third one which is, I think, the most um, the, the most prevalent in the process of trying to create art for me. It's this uh, scrutinizing laughter uh, type of person who's like desperately vigilant, looking for any any of your flaws that they can point at and poke and amplify and and, and just like hilariously laugh at you, right? Um, and so I there's. I had to edit this thing because I wrote the specific names of the people who are that in my life. Um, you don't want to share that with all of our viewers? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. It was from middle school and high school uh, for the most part, and just people who would look for any excuse to put me down. And wow. and one of them specifically almost looks like the painting that I did, but this very like 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 they're on a hunt looking for anything, right? Um, and the the fourth one is. Um, uh, the you know it's like a, a a character uh of a very judgmental person with a beard and that's more the religious experience and so and and i don't mean religious as in uh the spiritual beneficial way but the rat but like more like the zealot kind the type of person who's Dogma. Shame on, yeah yeah shame on everyone everything's a sin i'm perfect you are bad like this kind of holier than thou uh, and that happens a lot within uh, islam like you go to a mosque and you walk in if you uh, it will depends on where you go, of course. Things have changed, but back then, if you look like you're wearing a shirt with a like a for like a metal band uh, or rock or something, there's always like this guy that's like you out of cinder, like you know what I mean. So there's that. The fifth one over here uh, is uh, the face of disgust, and it's like this idea that when people feel threatened by you succeeding, that their instant their instinctual reaction is to dismiss it and say, that's, that's horrible. That's disgusting. You're gross. And like this kind of immediate reaction of putting you down. Um, it's similar to the reasons I think for the, the laughing bully, but the disgust one is more of a direct insecurity. And then the far right guy, uh, the final guy, it's the sixth demon mask character uh, is this uh, two faced liar. So it's almost in junction with the laughing bully, but this guy also, there was a list of names that who uh, would at first seem like people who are really 
good, like kind of like the sly fox in um, Pinocchio, like the trickster, uh, who kind of see any vulnerability or, or naiveness and take advantage of it and then use you to uh, either put you down or feel superior or whatever the social game might be. Um, and so these that I'm aware of are the six, let's say, feelings uh, or nodes that were were uh, present in my process that informed uh, the, the frantic Gollum version of me. So it's paranoid that my every move will be pointed out, ridiculed, shamed, all of these uh, things kind of swirling around, um, causing that paranoia. But and so I, want to say, I just love the the design sense in in your masks. Uh, mm. They're they're I don't know. I think like not only is this a really personal journey, but like I think it's interesting that like all of them have a third eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's just like I mean, like demons can be anything in the way that angels can be anything or, you know, all of it. I just think it's interesting to see like your personality has already come through in these. Uh, Thanks. And I, mm. I just think it's really cool to see where this is going. All right, please, please go on. I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. All right. And so, uh, yeah, the third eye, like the, the implication usually of the third eye is like your mind's eye, the ability to see um, beyond the, the physical and, you know, in this case, it's like they're beyond the physical because they're not physical. And so they can, that's why, I don't know, that, there's, there's other reasoning, but. Yeah, anyway, no, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they inform this this freaking out Gollum kid, uh, which is pretty much, it's as though that's that's who was behind the steering wheel if I was to do a drawing or a painting. And, um, and and that was informed in the formative years, middle school, high school, f from all these people, adults, kids, classmates, etc. And so this version is screaming at this version, which is the uh, exterior, which is you know Smeagol. Um, and uh, if that's all behind the wheel, it's like okay, why is all this happening? Um, and the key I think that's been helping me is addressing each one of these, let's say, demons, and by trapping them in a painting or something, because. Um, I ended up doing the laughing scrutinizing bully as a painting, um, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, but then it's like, okay, why is this? Why does it feel like art is such a social performance? And, and because if I'm doing art for myself, uh, these don't really happen. Um, like I don't really feel too much pressure or anxiety. And so as it becomes a social performance back during middle school and high school, it, it was very much this, Hey, Ahmed, I'm, it, I'm the artist. I, I'm good at art, and I'm known for that. And that's my tool to, uh, like, secure my position in the social group. And so I became the artist, and I have to make sure my art is good so that I'm liked, admired, I feel accepted, uh, praiseworthy. And so um, that's like kind of the realization I realization I had yesterday because uh, I was still suffering from it as I was doing the painting. Um, because even when I was doing the painting, I still wanted it to look good. I wanted it to be admired. I wanted it to be marketable, attention grabbing, all these things. And so the moment I wanted those things, the anxiety kicks in. And, uh, and it became like frustrating because then the art became a chore and I fell into that trap. And so, okay, why is that? And, uh, it's as though that the same format I had in middle school and high school of, oh, in order to be accepted, put forth the best art, be known as the best and and make sure you do the things that will get the praise and, and all those things. So uh, it's like a crowd of people are, are kind of watching, you know, this kind of Smeagol version of me, uh, whether it's in person, uh, social media, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like the ultimate death would be if I don't offer that in middle school and high school, whatever elementary, then the result would be, I'd be disappointing everyone. I'd lose my position as being someone who's accepted, uh, not living up to expectations, being dismissed as average, unworthy, overlooked, unnoticed, doing something that doesn't live up to what people like. And so um, all the while, while all of this is happening, you know, this is like the social, uh, let's say, I don't want to say game, but situation, uh, I put this image here because I think that I just, I just Googled soul and it's like I've been putting this off to the side um, and I don't let this inform my art. What I let inform my art was 
uh, it as a tool to be liked and admired and, and all this stuff. And I think that's an unfortunate thing. Another image as a chart of what it feels like is when I have a blank canvas, again, if it's just a personal piece that's not gonna be seen, I don't feel this, but if it's gonna be seen by people, I I would get beads of sweat. I literally feel stress and uh, this tension um, kind of like gripping me. And so what it feels like is that there's people um, waiting, right? So they're like, okay, let's go. Where is it? Let's see it. Come on. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. All right. Okay, oh, yeah. cool. I think every artist knows those people. <laughs> right. And they're just like, okay, yeah, yeah. Show, show the thing. And, and I fear this. So it's like disappointing them. We have like, ah, oh, really that? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh man. I'm so disappointed in you. Right. Like really, that's what you did. Uh, I guess we're going to have to take you a notch down and, and being accepted in this world. Um, and then you know, got, you know, Pepe, but, uh, but like all the while, there's a part of me that really, really wanted this. And it's like um, when people see the art, it, they're all like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And this becomes informed why, when, when people react that way to other art. And so I see other art being uh, praised and, oh, my God, but look, at the, look at the rendering. And so it becomes, okay, that's what I'm shooting for because the opposite would be all of this on the left. And then it's like... Uh, you know, the, the reality is there There might actually be people waiting and judging and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is people are just genuinely waiting to experience the artist, right? Um, but then, it, then it's like just another process, like what it feels like after I do any art. Like I even felt this yesterday when I did the piece, um, when I wanted it to be, let's say, something up here. And then I, and I analyzed it myself. I'm like, okay, no, it's not that I felt disappointed humiliated embarrassed like this is this is going to be the end of me i'm um, oh, real quick so you're yeah. saying after you finish a painting this is what you feel uh before, yes before you share it right am i understanding correctly yes okay thank you yeah please please go go on and so i've even i felt this every time i would do uh like my patreon content like okay I, i'll put it out anyway but i this is what i feel Right. And so uh, it's like they're all like, wow, really? Ha ha ha. LOL. Wow. You failed. You, you're you miserable. You're pathetic. And this is just the format of my experience in, in early schooling. Right. And everyone's like, boo, blah, blah, blah. And uh, disappointment. And there is uh, another shot in this. And so as a result, what it became is me in this format where I'm offering my art into the world uh, where, you know, uh, I'm testing the waters and putting it forth. It's like, okay, well, all these people are here. They're, they're going to see it at a small scale, a bigger scale, and now a huge scale with like YouTube and Instagram with all these numbers. And so like this becomes this immense weight, uh, like bearing down on the whole process. And, uh, but the, obviously uh, the problem with this is that uh, my, my own self value evaluation of my own work and my self worth became dependent on the numbers and the opinions of all these. Um, and it's like, it started to dictate kind of like a puppet master uh, of what I would do. And, and that, and, and, and by the way, and like seeing all this was, is, has been such a great epiphany. Um, and then that's just some, um, first yeah. off, I got to say, I really relate to a lot of the stuff you're talking about. Like the, the pressure of releasing stuff when you've got a decent sized audience is, yeah, it, I, it's, it's weighed on me a lot over the years. It, the more, the more successful I become in many ways, the more emotionally difficult it's been to release new art. Um, but I mean, uh, it, it, as someone who's done it really uh, on a regular basis, one of the things that I've seen that's been really common is there's a, there's a total, it lack of ability for me to judge the quality of my own art. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to be pretty terrible judges of, of whether or not we're doing any good. And I've had some that I thought were huge wins that just bombed. And I thought, and there's ones that I thought were just like totally just throw away pieces. I was just shipping it to ship it. No one would care. Yeah. That it turned out to be some of the most successful pieces I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just like over the years, like it's it, that struggle has never really gone away, mm -hmm. but there's a certain amount of realization of knowing that that's just a 
it's just an internal process and not something that's really real and has no bearing at all on the actual quality of the work or the relationship that people are going to have to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, just in constantly reminding myself of that and internalizing it and like seeing it in the work of the people around me. This is what I love about this process is as you scratch the surface or in your case, you're not even scratching the surface. You've dug pretty fucking deep. <laughs> Yeah, you're going, you're yeah. going straight down. You, went, yeah, you, you drill straight, straight down, yeah. Straight down in the best of ways. Um, and, uh, you know, other people are immediately going, oh, my God, he's saying, he's speaking my truth as well. Um, and that's what's cool is is then when that starts to be in the work, other people see their truth in your art. Right. And just from sharing your voice, just from, from yeah. it being you. So uh, yeah, just to be clear, I still feel this like uh, it's like oh uh, I, yeah, dude. I mean, I feel I that mean, every time about I finish painting. I mean, too. It's like I wish it was fully rendered. I wish all these things, blah 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 blah. But but one thing that stuck with me is when you said it's it's not about the the technique or the finish; it's the intention. And I think it still holds it. It's not quite finished, but um, this would be my uh, scrutinizing laughter mask guy. Yeah. Nice. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, so yeah, it's like um, it's got more than just uh, the three eyes, uh, but the, the idea is that um, he's got like a kind of diseased heart with all these snakes coming out of it, um, and because I think when we embody those people, uh, the bullies and stuff, we ourselves are broken. So um, it's implying that this entity is himself broken and and at the same time there's actually nothing behind the mask all it is is a mask for me because it's just a an idea floating in my head um and so like you know i, I kind of built these uh rocks coming up here i have a, a sketch of what will be like yeah. an embodiment of the human yep. and this just giant finger pointing at the thing um but yeah like this is you know, one of the, of the six that I'm, you know, kind of working on and yeah, that's it. This painting was initially going to be three masks in one. And here's an early version of it. So yeah. it's like those three. Um, but then I realized, well, I could instead focus on each emotion, uh, you know, isolated and, and then express them. Um, but <clears throat> you know, like the idea of walking up and confronting, uh, this, uh, feeling, to kind of get in there and, and uh, make it not, you know, have a hold on me. Let's see. Uh, so I think I already talked about this, but when I was doing this, I did fall into the trap of wanting to make this marketable. Um, and I think that got in the way because marketable meant playing that uh, social game. And so uh, it became, I think, at a certain point, despite still having the intention there, it became rigid forced and a chore um and the inner golem is saying something like hey man you impressed people with your painting skills before so you have to uphold those expectations and not disappoint them otherwise you'll lose your position um and then you know what i assume will happen with this piece is that people will be disappointed let down not living up to expectations disappointed and all that stuff so yeah it's just uh, it, but it's it's a really good milestone for me because it did help me reach certain uh, epiphanies about the process and, and, you know, being vulnerable with it little by little. Yeah, the, 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 when you have a big problem, it's some of it that comes from, you know, personal growth and working on your mental health and, and that, but a lot of it comes from systemic choices like scheduling, whether or not you're recording, what materials you're using, you know, uh, what are you doing before and after the times where you're working diet, exercise, those sorts of things end up adding up, to the majority of, of the, the outcome. Um, right. and, and so, you know, what, what I advise with everybody is to take a serious look at all the systemic stuff that's going into the work and worry about that first before you worry too much about how stuck you are on an existential level. Because the existential stuff okay. is important and it's really something we should always be thinking about and it's part of the journey. But the things that are going to make these big, broad stroke differences as far as your experience go often come from the systemic learning. As I mentioned, schedule is a, a big no-no for me. And it's like this thing that I don't want to do. It's like 
confining and it makes me feel like I'm sort of imprisoned by it. But I've, I've sort of come up with a way before to, to get around that because I know schedules help a lot because when I have things listed, uh, it's just it's not in my mind and I could see it like, oh, well, I, just got, I have to get that thing done. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And then I have to do this at this time. So here's what I kind of have. And I could have used like an app or something, but I prefer like analog things. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, just to share with the audience, it's like a, <clears throat> it's a dry erase board and it has like the time schedule. So today I woke up at eight and, you know, it goes all the way to 9 p.m. And I have these little uh, magnetic uh, things that I wrote. Okay. Around. Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> coffee. And this one says paint. And so, uh, and basically what I do, I wake up in the morning and I just put, okay, well, I know this is the priority box and, you know, Patreon term 23, I got to put that here somewhere, right? Because otherwise I have all these projects that I have to do and want to do, but if they're like in this nebulous thing in my mind, I can't really um, get it done. So like, you know, I have workout here, then plan for Boston here because I'm going to Boston this week. Um, and then I got meditate, sister's birthday today at 2 p.m. So it's like, uh, this seems to be as close to a schedule as I can do and be okay with it. I and, love it. Yeah. <clears throat> Get a, 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 a working paradigm called getting things done, which was mm -hmm. about uh, a system specifically for externalizing all obligations into a paper or digital system. So, and, and they have suggestions on how to do it specifically. So you never need to hold anything in working memory. And right. the idea behind this philosophy is that if you can get down to zero working memory being used for the bullshit in your day and you get it, fully trusted and externalized, not only will you be able to switch tasks at a moment's notice, but you just, you have more mental energy reserved yeah. for everything else that you're doing. Yeah. Um, it's like RAM, and, mental RAM. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I know that I've struggled with that quite a bit. And so this was something I got really excited about for a bit, but I had a hard time keeping up with the maintenance of the system. And so finding a way of externalizing it is the system that you can trust, that you're committed to, that you can use, and yeah. that you won't just spend a bunch of time building up and then discarding, yeah. uh, and then kicking yourself for discarding, and then building something else up and doing more research. That's that's the cycle I find myself in. I'm sure it's a, it's a common one. Talking with my wife about that this morning, actually, about how terrible high school was. And I was saying, you know, this is what it comes down to. This is a conversation we had last week. I suck at switching tasks every 45 minutes. Like, and I, I also wasn't able to have coffee. So it was like, as soon as I got into college and I had three hour class blocks and coffee, like I went from being like a problem student to being like top of my class. And there it was entirely due to the structural nature of my day and had yeah. a lot less to do with me, you know, committing to, you know, being good versus bad <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't qualitative. It, it was structural. And so this, this is one of the, you know, looking back on experiences like that reinforced my belief that a lot of the problems that we have are, end up being solved structurally rather than, mm -hmm. you know, trying to solve them in, in terms of like, um, yeah, just a it's uh, basically it's like for me, the anxiety came up of like, all right, what does finished mean? Because someone told me to finish a piece. And in my mind, like I felt this tension and anxiety because, well, what it means is do enough brush strokes to trick people and avoid them asking, why isn't it finished? When are you going to finish it? <laughs> yeah, why, yeah. why are you taking so long? Why is this not done? Um, so to me, it's like that voice becomes part of the equation and uh, it gets in the way uh, and it starts informing, okay, well, it's got to be highly rendered, no visible brush strokes, detail everywhere. And it became this nightmare of serving that. Um, and so if you scroll down a little bit more, um, I remember a quote, I think it was Michelangelo. It was like, well, there's no such thing as a finished painting. It's only abandoned. So you can pretty much work on a painting indefinitely. Right. And so I realized that <clears throat> it's not that there is a such thing as here is the standard of what is finished for everyone. Because if you look at, you know, Jamie Jones or Craig Mullins or someone who does things far more rendered, there's a different you know, range. And so if you kind of look at the arrow part, uh, scroll down a bit, it's like the equation becomes a finished piece is going to be the intent. So the intention, maybe you want to do a piece about love or uh, anxiety plus time and action. So uh, at first the, the piece might be loose and at a certain point, the intent will be clear. Uh, so it might be anger or 
uh, just a storytelling thing of My Little Pony. I don't know. Uh, so there's a certain point where it'll, be, it'll become clear, and you could even say that, hey, to me, that's done. Uh, but what I have never really done is increase the amount of time as a variable on working on something. Um, because in that time, although it's infinity, you as an artist will start making creative decisions and choosing things and seeing things that are incomplete and uh, might wanting to like uh, change it. <coughs> Was it Da Vinci that said that? Yeah, okay. Um, and so it's like, the more you go, the more refined it is. And then it's up to you to decide where it, where finished is, right? And so if you can open um, 008 Gatekeeper. Uh, so this was as I finished, quote unquote finished, while under the impression, or let's say under the gun of, hey, the, the intent of this is to, so that when you show it, no people are gonna be like, okay, fine, yeah, fine, this is finished. And as opposed to, all right, why isn't it done? It's not done, it's not finished. And so like, I'm like, okay, so why do I even feel so much pressure of this person questioning why it's not done and stuff? Which takes me back to high school, my art teacher, she was bleh, horrible. Um, oh. I, like, it, it's one thing to be an art teacher and have like some kind of guidance and homework and, and whatever, but it was more like, and she even had this like nasally do uh, voice. She was like, I'm mad. Or no, she, would, she wouldn't even call me by my name properly. She would say, she'd say, I'm odd. When are you going to finish your painting? <laughs> and it's not done. I'm odd. Think about the composition. And so like I resented that. And so the idea of finishing something reminded me and made me feel like I was under this like wagging finger, right? And so, I mean, like we could even say that it's, it, it can it conveys the the intent, um, but if you scroll, if you zoom in really closely, you'll find unfinished brushstrokes. You'll find things that aren't refined, like sketch work that wasn't completed, um, and like that. That's how I felt like that that person being yelled at uh, as I was doing this piece. And so, I think I think I didn't enjoy any of that, but at the very least, it resulted in me learning about why I feel that way and how to overcome it. So if you go to the, let's see, 00inquisit3, trying to define what finished means. So if you can zoom in at the top part, um, there's a certain thing uh, as a part of the process of making art that is natural to us. So upon looking at the sentence, we naturally are able to see what's missing in the gap. So hey, who are up? So there's a part of our brain that fills in the gap where it kind of fills it in with the, what are you up to? We can all do that, fair enough. Now the intent of the sentence is clear and we have this urge to fill in those gaps. And so that's what I'm honing in on. And so the problem is you can keep going forever. You can refine it, make it cleaner. Um, and so depending on the artist, hey, what are you up to? That sentence could look better and you could zoom in even further. And if you go all the way down, you could go down to the, the, the specific angles and, and curves and corners. Um, and this, this is, I'd say, the act of refinement, but it happens at this instinctual urge to see something complete. Um, and then if you go to, uh, let's see, uh, Inquisit 4, uh, this is uh, just as a part of the, the painting that I'll show in a moment. But basically, if you, if you look at the first slide, um, it's coming back to the painting after a break. And so I've had a, a moment to get, you know, a, a fresh eye when I return. And then it's not this tyrannical, hey, you got to finish this, but rather, oh, look, there's some missing letters of this word, of the sentence that I naturally see. Um, and I, and my brain is pretty much seeing the green, not that it, not that I draw that out every time. But it's like, oh, here, here are the gaps. Here are the missing letters that I could, you know, get in there um, and, you know, quote unquote, complete the sentence. And so on the far right is those things becoming more complete. Um, and I think if you just scroll down, it's just an explanation of that as opposed to, uh, <clears throat> you know, the sentence completing process is what it means to go in and finish a painting. Um, and it's like, it doesn't mean, uh, like finishing a painting, this is just for me and it might help others. It doesn't mean that you're supposed to avoid people saying, when are you gonna finish it? Why isn't it done? Is it done yet? Uh, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So. Um, that was a, this is the epiphany that I had so far. I love that last one. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so that's my inner critic amplifying yeah, the, yeah. The external information. Um, so this for me was was a great revelation. Uh, like the intense becomes okay. Sure, there's the mask, there's the demon thing, and then the the secondary intense that was introduced is hey, but really finish it, and then that provided a new demon, which was, as I described, the demon of the old art teacher. Um, and by addressing it and, and separating the, the intents, like, okay, this intent is to serve the art demon and make sure I avoid being yelled at. And this intent is, oh, I'm just completing sentences for me. Um, and then if you go to Inquisit, and it's just short for Inquisitor, because that's the, the demon. Um, so this is one of the masks. It's gonna. It's like a slightly different in theme, in terms of uh, just instead of a floating mask, it's like a big giant, you know, character demon. Uh, but it's the Inquisitor, the type of let's say person who's like, what, what is this? Explain yourself. What, what are you doing? Um, and so I tried to capture this like kind of disapproval uh, expression on the face, as well as a hand saying, "Come on, what, what is this?" Like. Uh, and it could be interpreted as like, oh, this is just a really cool big boss that you fight in a game, yeah, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and so in terms of finishing it, like I'm automatically seeing the, the green outlines of, oh, this area could be that. Oh, I could add this here and this, this, and that. And so the, 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 the part of the equation that I never allowed for is A, completing the sentence and then in, in the metaphor, and then B, time. And so because most of my work was done last minute just to get things done and I couldn't do it ahead of time because of anxiety. Now it's like, I have the equation of time that I can expand. I could start weeks earlier on my content and I can allow for the sentence completing process to happen as opposed to, oh, I have to do this in three days. Oh, I have to make it look like it's finished so that people don't ask me, hey, why isn't it finished? This isn't what I paid for, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so that was, just kind of an overview of, of what happened in the, in the last week. No, yeah. That's great. I had two, I had two commissions come in recently, which is very, very rare for me. And one mm. of them, they described what they wanted to start with. Like, Hey, here's a design we want you to build up from in yeah. your style. And uh, they, but when I was like, well, what kind of color palette do you want for this? You know, what kind of finish do you want? They're just like, eh, don't worry about it. Like, let's see what happens. And so it was starting from the beginning, like this is what where we're, this is where the beginning of this piece is, and that's what they defined. And then the other commission, also very open, they gave me examples of previous paintings I'd done and said, we want these kinds of color palettes, we want this kind of finish, we want this level of dynamicism. And they were describing what they wanted at the end of the process. Mm -hmm. And for me, the the commission, even though both of them were very open ended, yeah. they one that even the one that seems less open, which is the one that they, they gave me a design to work from actually to me felt way, way easier to finish because I knew where to start. <laughs> I knew where to build up from while the other one, assuming the conclusion for me feels horrible. Like it immediately makes me anxious to start on it because now I need to back solve from the end back to the beginning. And so when you start with a piece and you say, well, this needs to be this level of finish. And this is what, this is what that done looks like. And when you're not, when you're not at that point in the painting yet, when you're still trying to figure out what the painting's even about, those sorts of, of thoughts to me feel like deeply, deeply counterproductive. Right. Um, they, 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 they put this pressure on me mentally that makes it very difficult for me to work on the thing that's essential at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so starting from the beginning of the piece and then providing yourself with the time and mental way to say, oh, what does this piece need right now? Where are we with this thing right now? What am I seeing in this on the page at the moment? And then, you know, just looking forward only one step. It is has been like, I, I you know, it's, it's something I've thought about um, over the last, uh, it's something that's become more and more clear to me as I've gotten more mature as an artist is like how important it is to not try to prognosticate too far in advance yeah. and to just be with the piece at the moment and see what it needs right then that like that short sightedness and that, uh, you know, that, that presence in the moment, it really ends up producing better long-term results 
that, um, you know, you really just, you can't, you, you can count on to a degree. Mm. Like if you know that you work through the process one step at a time, carefully and be present with the work that the end result will be good enough. You know, uh, you can, you can bank on that. I mean, you're, you kind of do, cause that's what your career is. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah. what you can't do is, is start with conclusion and, and say that this is what this piece is going to be about. This is how that is going to be executed. This is the level of finish it will take. This is the aspect ratio it will be like, you really just, you can't, starting starting with that conclusion feels troubling and it feels counterproductive in a way that's that's kind of yeah it, it's almost counterintuitive it becomes forced yeah yeah right. the other thing i want to add is for for those of you at home that maybe aren't um quite as far along in your art journey as med is a, a really great way to form a, an indicator is uh i find when i'm like a third into a piece or in the middle of a piece starting to think about how finished i want it to be I usually pick one, maybe two artists, not just that I love their work, but that I wish my work looked like their work. And I pull up examples and I set it next to the piece I'm working on. And for me, that means actually either printing it out or looking at a book next to my oil painting and saying, have I, am, is it as finished as that guy's work? Because like, let's say you pick Greg Manchester, right? So mm -hmm. Finished is loose brush strokes and blurry mm. edges and maybe one area that's tight. But let's say you pick Dan DeSantos. Then all of a sudden, mm. you know, your your final oil painting is like super rendered with lots of glowy edges. And yet both of those guys are doing constantly doing book cover work, constantly considered to be uh, you know, pillars of the field of fantasy illustration. And they could not be more different in terms of style, content, and what finished means. And so I feel like part of learning as an artist is and finding what finished means to you is not just what art do you love, but when you see work, you think, oh, I wish my painting looked like that can also be something that helps point you in that direction. And there's a quote by Mike Mignola that I mm -hmm. love so much that I'm, I've said on the show before, I'm going to say again, mm -hmm. Mike Mignola said, you know, he always wished he could do a great Jack Kirby drawing, but all he ends up doing are crappy Mike Mignola drawings. <laughs> And so like, I, I feel like that so perfectly illustrates as we, especially early in our careers, strive to look like the artists we admire, eventually so much of you comes through and you never quite get there. But what's exciting is that along the way, your voice comes through. Yeah. And if you look at Mike Mignola's work, you go, of course he was influenced by Jack Kirby. How could he not be? It's all there in black and white. Mm. But at the same time, Mike Mignola has created a revolution of so many people that wished they could draw like Mike Mignola. And uh, another thing I want to add to this um, <clears throat> as a part of what I learned um, and kind of paid attention to this week is uh, like a lot of us go into art and, and kind of just put it out there as a sort of representation of us. Mm -hmm. Right. And so last week I asked something along the lines of like, what, do I do? What is the category? Like, how do you find what it is that you do? Um, and so I was under this pressure that whatever it is I that I choose to do is the identity that I put forth that people perceive me by. And so I saw that as a kind of problem because then it's like, well, I got to control how I'm being seen. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as a, an alternate equation, it's like, it doesn't, it's not about me. It's about whatever the experience is and whatever happens in the time and action portion, that's it. There's no, you know, this whole like thing that I was struggling with was I want to be seen as the sci-fi Jamie Jones. I want to be seen as the, the, the Sakimi Chan of this thing. Right. So it became this, well, it is a comparative game, but also an identity game. And it became, and it's so, yeah. you come from a place of insecurity of mm -hmm. like, you don't know what your identity is. And I didn't know what mine was. I still don't, and it doesn't matter. It's just now the, all that matters is I have the tools in my tool belt of in terms of skills, and I have things in front of me, and I have story ideas. It's just the time element, just action and time. Yeah. Um, and the more that I sat and thought about trying to control what the outcome should be, the, the worse it would just get, and I would just never get anything done. And so that was a that was a really good epiphany as well. It's, it's to not be so concerned about. Um, what it is that I do and 
and the reason I would be so concerned is like, if I started doing a quick sketch and turned into something like a sci-fi armor piece that kind of felt like destiny, the voice would be like, Oh, so you, so you're going to be the destiny guy. You're going to be, <laughs> yeah, you're going to be exactly. that guy. Oh, oh okay. That, that's cool. I guess. But, and then it's like, wait, I don't want to be known as something inside a category or a box. So I stopped doing it. I do something else. Go it's ahead. like when you, it's like when uh, you're like a, you know, you're an anxious teenager, you go to the store and you see like, there's a cool hat on the shelf and yeah. you're like, Oh, what if I buy this like weird hat? Am I going to be like the hat guy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> am I going to wear, am I like, what if I wore like a pork pie hat like every day? Would that be like a cool thing? That's like my thing. Like, is this like a thing that I saw like in a, a photo or in a video somewhere, someone was wearing this and they look cool. I look cool if I wear this hat. And like, that conversation is kind of beside the point. It's a it's a yeah. fucking ridiculous yeah. conversation, and everyone I think has had it at different points where they they try to they they're trying to play around with like what their identity is and how yeah. they project that identity, and at time and like time. yeah over the time over the course of our lives I think we we figure out who we are, what we like, how we project ourselves, and being okay with it. Yes, yeah, yeah, and and that it is a lifelong struggle, and it's perfectly reflected in art because yeah. you're doing the exact same thing again okay so i'm am i going to make a statement am i like the yeah am i like the destiny guy like you know it, it's like you want to be able to do the things that are like what inspires you but then if you're just doing them are you just like a rip-off version of that like right. where does the boundary lie yeah. and it's one of those it's one of those eternal struggles we've talked about it a little bit on the show too the um i like the helsinki bus terminal theory um which is that um, all the buses that come out of the Helsinki bus terminal all trace the same path for the first half mile. And so if you keep trying to get somewhere different in town and keep getting off the bus right away and going back to the bus terminal, you'll always end up retracing the same path over and over again. Mm. If you want to go somewhere else, you have to stay on the fucking bus. Uh, and then the, the, the lesson is stay on the fucking bus. Like if you draw, if you are wanting to draw some destiny armor or whatever, draw the destiny armor and then keep going. Yeah, and yeah. if you stay on the bus long enough, eventually you'll find yourself in new territory. And so rather than constantly second guessing the choice and starting over and over and over again, the choice should be stay on the bus, keep working through it. Exactly. You know, our advice to you last week, you're like, well, what's the work? We're like, you do all six masks. Right. So you stay on the fucking bus. Like, yeah. what is this? What does this series represent? Nobody knows. Right. We don't know. You don't know. Yeah. Nobody um yeah so this was the the one the first one the one that gave me like a lot of the anxiety about finishing things and that prompted the question of what does finish mean as a good learning experience and i think ye one, yellow and anxiety really go together very very hmm. well and then this one is the uh the inquisitor the hey what the hell do you think you're doing uh kind of invalidator type thing um yeah you're right it's like there's a lot to explore here uh, i did i actually did start a sketch for the uh I forgot to show this one uh, for the next one, but it, it's like the the trickster character, mm -hmm. like, hey, come this way. You can trust me kind of thing. Um, but you, now that I notice it, it's like, yeah, it's very similar um, color palette for the first two. And then. Oh, Sam, can you flip to mine? I got my screen share up. I've got I got this. <coughs> my, um... Well, yeah, let's wait till meds finished and then, then I'll, oh, I'll yeah. use up. Yeah. It can't right. be both at the same time. Uh, here was an earlier sketch, and also oh, like this. I really like that. That's a cool sketch. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I ended up. Th this was going to be the Inquisitor, um, but it ended up being a little bit more like, "What the fuck, man?" Yeah, so, yeah. I like that too. Uh, Wait, this, you can make revisit it. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I like the the genie reference in there. That's good. Yeah, this is gonna. This was going to be the other uh, trickster because, like, you know, these are the tricksters. From yeah, the, yeah. The archetypes that we know, and then uh, I, I think it was a bit. I mean, maybe I'll merge these two. Uh, sure. Kind of just take this over, put it there as a an idea. But yeah, that's kind of a sneak peek into the process. That's great. Um, yeah, but that's uh, this was actually the the piece that I was doing that uh, made me question, like, oh, wait, are you the destiny guy now? So, uh, but it was fun to do. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, are you the destiny guy now? <laughs> no. I, I, <laughs> All right, so I've got the um, I got the color sapped out oh, here, okay. yeah. and so I've got this gradient map, and this is with it. It's blended to soft soft light. You're more bakering it 
It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so here's here's the how broke. Look at I really like the broken ones. Look at this is like rainbow, but just on the highlights, right? So like, let's turn this down by. This wouldn't look this this gradient doesn't look like anything that looks like a color palette, right? But as it as like an accent built into this, like look Ooh. at look at a weird cool. It's like it's creating this sort of crazy chromatic aberration just in like the highlight area, and so awesome. there's all sorts of really weird, interesting stuff. I've got one here that just adds a little bit of warmth right on the edge of mm. the highlight for everything. So you know you flip this on and off, and it just like Makes those highlights warm. I just gotta on learn the edge. Gradient maps. It's, uh, it's gradient, so maps are, gradient maps are kind of weird, um, but it's just like you can basically you can use it as kind of like a color grading tool. So you can, in, in some cases, end up with almost a complete color palette. But some of them are so broken and bad. But um, some of them do really interesting things, like this thing. This one it inverts the um, the middle range of the color of the value pattern. So stuff that ends up really high highlights and really deep shadows end up popping out and like kind of becoming like higher. Paper. Yeah, yeah. And so oh. I use I use this one uh, a lot when I'm trying when I feel like I've over rendered something yeah. and I want to sort of um, bring out like uh, the most contrasty bits and then wash the middle out a little bit. This is this is really useful for that. Um, so it's like a, it does it does a number of things in addition to the color palette part. But it can be just because it's so fast. Look at, I mean, I doubt, I doubt you would be considering green and purple as a viable solution for this. But the way, when I was talking about it wrapping around the values, yeah, like the way that it's introducing these, these shapes of color around the face. And then when you just pull these little bars around, you could, it sort of crawls its way across the painting in very unpredictable ways. So you can start to see very, very different. Ooh, I like that yeah. And yeah, so it, it becomes genius, very, man. very <laughs> so experimental cool. very quickly. And I see people misuse this a lot because they, they then become precious with it. But the goal is not to become precious. The goal is to become inspired. And mm. the goal is to stay flexible and let the work tell you what the possibilities are. And, okay. um, and it's like sometimes a really, really broken version turned down a little bit will start to turn into like a nice, subtle, interesting thing. Um, and it's it's a great way to just like, you know, not over rely on what you believe the conclusion to be. You know, stay, so stay really open to what, what yeah. you think this piece might be and let it, let it tell you something about itself. And that's exactly it. It's like, uh, I don't want to just rip off of your color palettes and like, you know, have it be that, but rather, mess around with it and see what speaks to the piece and speaks to me and, but, run and with it. the springboard too like if he picks this orange and blue one okay i'm digging that but now you're gonna render it and bring yeah. your to it and maybe that orange gets a little brighter in certain places or you know it's just a yeah. way to start saying oh well what if all the shadows were orange that's crazy you know like mm. I mean, what, whatever it is i love it uh, and yeah, even on top of this, I mean, um, I use I use hard light as a blending mode to bring in local colors and, and color mm. accents and stuff from here. Okay. So even if I say, well, I generally want it tinted like this, I want it to look like the matrix, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can still bring oranges into this on layers above it. This isn't the end of the color palette. So if you start right. hard lighting in some stuff on top of this, you can end up with, uh, you can introduce additional colors into the palette. You can you know, find color lighting, you can bring in local colors, all those things are, uh, are possibilities on top of whatever you discover inside of this. So this, this ends up being, um, depending on what you see in it, it can be a springboard into whatever you want. It's, this is, this is artwork. I mean, we, we have, yeah, yeah. I, I, I gotta say, rules. I've, I haven't gotten a paint over since I was in art school, maybe like 12 years ago. And this yeah, is yeah. really nice. This is it's, so nice. It's, it's not finally, a paint someone's over, helping me. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a paint over. I mean, this is just I like mean, me playing it's, around. Yeah. I, I'm mostly just a matter of tool use. You know, I've got my, I got my own piece up here too. Oh, I'm, nice. I'm at a really, really loose place with this right now, but I'm doing the same yeah. sort of thing, trying to, and I've got layers of, of messing around with different gradient maps and, um, <laughs> and overlays and repainting stuff as I'm trying to Very find cool. my way through a thing. 
and it's that's it i mean it's a it's a matter of like being being open to discovery and letting the piece speak to you and letting the good voices in because when you're absorbed with it like that then it's yeah. it's this amazing process all right thanks for watching uh, i know i'm often on a hiatus but uh i've been really enjoying proving myself and and my art so stay tuned for more to come all right see you next time